I would like to thank Alexa and her team, uh, and the team, sorry, for inviting me. I know we say that generally with staff, but I really need this to see. I'm genuinely flattered. I'm slightly unsure where I'm here. Uh, how I've managed to find you an invite, but I am. So thank you very much. You've made me feel very welcome. So thank you very much. Um, in the spirit of honesty, which I've seen, I've picked up from the way people have spoken, so Ingrid and Sarah, is it, and so so forth, I'm also going to be honest and say I'm perhaps more nervous than usual for two <coughs> reasons. I'm going out of my comfort zone with this, and I'm going to the theory, and I haven't got any data that, that I would typically think of data. And there's my confession, and one of my many confessions that come out. I haven't got the interview extracts, they're my, I realise they're my crutch, um, and I let them do the talking for me. And I haven't got them in this, I'm looking to the theory, uh, which is very unusual, so I'm feeling very nervous, so I'm going to might refer to my notes perhaps more than we would all like, so please forgive me. And I'm also nervous, more nervous than usual, because really I'm just going to tell you what you have been writing yourselves. Um, I'm going to refer to a lot of people in the room, uh, their published work, their research, and I'm just going to tell you what you already know in that sense. So I'm, I'm very flattered to be here because there's better people that can be speaking more well than me. Today I'm going to talk about a paper that I'm putting together with Lucy Frith, who is at Liverpool, and uh, Rich uh, Williams, who's at Lancaster. And again, I'm going out of my comfort zones on this because I'm working with a somebody who looks at complexity and systems thinking, which is very new for me. So I'm a bit of a mad pie in that. I do like things to look shiny and sparkle and look interesting. I'm suddenly down that way. Never mind the fact I don't have any background in it. And, um, so I've been very interested in doing a lot of reading uh, around complexity and systems thinking. Um, but this really came about from my own research. Um, I was very fortunate to start re uh, researching gamete donation, social ethical aspects of gamete donation as far back as my master's actually, and I then was fortunate to get a PhD looking at embryo donation. So I'd gone from gamete donation from fertility uh, for people, for couples to conceive, uh, to then embryo donation uh, for both uh, infertility as well as stem cell research. In my postdoc, I was really fortunate to then work with people in uh, STS, science and technology studies, um, around cold blood banking and cold blood donation. And again, that was for transplantation. Um, and uh, I was sort of finding myself going down organ donation as a result of the transplantation. <laughs> so, uh, and I've been looking at organ donation most recently now uh, at Lancaster. What I found really unusual though is that even though I was looking at different forms of donation, so I was looking at so different body parts and fluids and products being donated, and then I was looking at different purposes of donation, so for art or for edu medical education, for example, donated dead bodies being donated from their beds, organ donation. Um, <coughs> I felt that there was, I couldn't transfer the knowledge that I'd learned from the previous project because that was gamete donation, that was gamete donation for fertility, so I couldn't transfer that to organ donation to treat for transplantation. <coughs> I didn't know if it could hold relevance. So it got me thinking about why is it that if I try and can make, transfer this knowledge and I want to start making comparisons, I start finding inconsistencies and contradictions, both in policy and in practice and knowledge. And I thought it made me think about is there not one donation? We talk about one donation, but is there really one donation? So um, what I want to try and I'm, I'm sort of exploring is how we understand donation, is that influencing how we research donation? And equally, how we research a nation is that from we can't understand the nations. And I'm sorry if that's a very circular argument, but I suppose that's what I'm grappling with. It was interesting when I start thinking about donation, I ever write a paper or start a presentation on donation, irrespective of what form, for what purpose. I felt like I just had to have to reference Richard Tibbs's work from a different relationship. Almost as an editor or a reviewer, you go to wait for that kind of comeback or where's it where's Richard Tibbs, but you can't talk and write about it. That really annoyed me. I was like, why am I, why am I tied to this? If it's not in my work, why do I have to feel compelled to reference it? I then went to the literature, again looking at people's work uh, that have been in, you know, Eric Haynes, Naomi Pfeffer, uh, people who've been doing this for a lifetime. And we always start with Richard Tibbs. And again, they were talking about completely aborted fetuses being donated for stem cell research to embryo donation that being used for infertility. Egg donation, sorry, with, with Eric Haynes. And then also I then looked to policy, and I thought, again, we're still starting with Richard Tibbs' notion of this gift relationship. We see it in all information when we talk about the gift of life discourse and campaigns. This, it was one of the guiding principles for the Human Tissue Authority, 
uh, with regards to the acquisition and use of human organs and tissue. And then in the case of tissue donation for research, the UK Medical Research Council was absolutely unwavering in its position that any donation was going to be seen and treated as a gift. So I wanted to look at what the legacy of tips, because it feels like this kind of, I feel really sorry for Richard, like, I, I, I just got <laughs> sorry for him. And that's not meant to be the case at all. But I, I wanted to, he felt like he's left this legacy, but where we talk about donation. And I wanted to look at these kind of, what I've thought is, I call these four sort of dominant cultural scripts that seem to exist around do uh, donation. But I wanted to question, as all the researchers have, if they're still relevant to donation practices and policies today, and if they are relevant, if they are relevant or irrelevant, in what form and in what purpose of the donation. So the first one I thought about was altruism. And, you know, we can look to the literature to find that donors do ask for some kind of acknowledgement in some cases, however small that might be. They also look for some donors will look to uh, benefit from their donation. I'm thinking here about tissue donors who will participate in some kind of donation to research <laughs> in that they might get some kind of health checks that, that they perceive that they wouldn't normally be eligible for. Um, again, aborted fetuses. Naomi Pfeffer's work talks about women um, explaining why they donated their aborted fetuses to um, research. And for some, they felt it was this kind of moral you know, um, vanishing effect that they were somehow being washed of any sin related to this act as a result of you know, giving back and it wasn't being wasted. And then thinking about community and solidarity, the core of, of why, you know, this blood donation happened in the 1960s for Richard Titmuss. I think now we can argue that it's being eroded. I think you hear about um, hybrid cord blood banks. So people, will, women would um, agree to blood being donated when they give birth for hybrid cord blood banks. So these are banks that will take 100% of your of the cord blood and divide it into 80%, same bag, 80% being used for their own use and 20% being available for public use if anybody needed it for treatments for sickle cell anemia, thalassemia and leukemia. So the cord blood can treat blood disorders, very similar to bone marrow. So again, it's that, that sort of hybrid, right? It's, this, it's sort of erasing this idea of community, of community. And it's also under revision with the donation infrastructure. Again, all anticipated communities have come about. I think you hear about public cord blood banks. I was speaking last night with Hannah uh, about how if you live um, up north, as I do, um, it's very recently, I think the last two years, we've had a public cord blood bank. So if you were giving birth up north, you wouldn't be able to donate <coughs> the cord blood to a public bank. What's the problem with that, perhaps? <coughs> But the women that I interviewed, they felt that they were being perceived discrimination, that they were not being able to benefit from having their cord blood and their baby's cord blood stored in a public bank, which in their mind was free. Free storage to cost to store it costs two thousand pounds a year. So if you don't, if you're getting public cord blood um, stored for free, their perception was, and this is not to say that these were ignorant women at all, but their perception was that their, if a baby ever fell ill, that that cord blood sample would be available to them to use in a stem cell transplant if they needed it. Scientifically, the argument is that if you don't, you wouldn't want your own cord blood to be used <coughs> in a stem cell transplant, because if you do have leukemia, thalassemia, or sickle cell anemia, it's going to be in the cord blood, and you wouldn't want it back into yourself. The scientific argument. So that, I'm not saying that the women I interviewed were ignorant, um, but I just think that was, there was an idea that they were being denied free public storage and they had no right to donate. And this all anticipated community had been formed together around something quite negative. And I think we also can think about the community now is on this global scale with the introduction of European registers. We have the World Cord Blood Bank now, the World Bone Marrow Bank. And these products are being collected in order to meet very diverse ethnic groups across the country. So to put into context, you might get a cord blood unit that costs around £30,000 per unit. In order to treat an adult for a stem cell transplant, you need roughly four units. So we're looking at £100,000 and governments are trading in cord blood. They are benefiting from that. But I mean, Jesse Cooper's work will be able to tell you far more about the separation of ethnic and uh, diverse uh, elements around uh, organ donation, but uh, this is just one. I wanted to talk about the cord because I knew Jess was coming, so she could move on. So moving on to um, the, 
the sort of area of the third uh, cultural, dominant cultural script. I think people in the room may know better than I do and be able to give other examples, but I think the one of the legacies from Tibbis is particularly around incentives. Somebody's already talked, I'm sorry, I've forgotten about the Northfield Council, was it Rachel was talking about yes. the Council of Bioethics? You know, I, I think to be fair, we could say that the idea of incentives around any form of donation uh, is a real kind of bullshit from policymakers. We, we don't want to start in, uh, incentivising people in terms of financial reward. Um, we talk about tissue based, uh, based economies, we talk about resource commodification, marketisation of human bodies. So we've ended up in this rather called quite ridiculous situation where we don't talk about people being paid for donating their eggs or their sperm. They're reimbursed for their travel and their childcare and their annual leave to be at this appointment. But they're not being paid, let's be very clear about that. Semantics, but okay. So when we think about consent being challenged with the when we think about companion uh, animals donating organs or donating blood, when we think about organ donation, the opt-out system that we've just heard from Rachel in the video clip, it's now enshrined in Wales and under review for England. I'm wondering how much consent is still, this voluntary idea of consent is still there when we talk about donation. In corporate donation, there's been much debate as to who is that donor. Is it the mother? that's donating that cord blood, or is it the baby that's donating the cord blood, when both are at either end of that cord blood, that placenta. Uh, and we've just heard as well about in the case of deceased organ donation, practitioners will rarely go ahead with an organ donation <coughs> if the next of kin refuse and for it to go ahead, despite that person being not perhaps on the register. And I'm talking about obviously old school practices now, not with the presumed descent you brought in. The conditional and directive um, element Oh, it really makes me think about embryo donation. The idea that how far can you influence who receives your donation? You know, we see with embryo donation, some women, uh, some clinics rather, will enable uh, women and all their partners to be able to say, I want it to go to people with a particular religion or a particular ethnicity. I don't want it to go to this person or these groups of people. I will decide that that embryo that has a genetic abnormality can be donated or cannot be donated. Whereas with organ donation, the HTA prohibits any form of conditional or directed donations after an incident of a white man's next of kin requested that his organs were only given to white people. So the last one, the last cultural script is LNMC. And I think it's fair to say that it's been formally challenged to hear around gamete donation. So we've had the removal of anonymity uh, with sperm and egg donors, which was really driven hard by some policy and uh, citizen groups. And the, and the uh, sort of aim of achieving this very socially responsible donor that we wanted. We also see it's informally challenged as well. We've all been to donors' kin and recipients now going to great lengths to try and actually formulate some kind of bond and kinship and find each other and make that connection. I really love this about my med students, the study that we did, and it's not just mine, it's across the patch. They will call their dead bodies at their work, they're learning about med ed, about anatomy, they'll give them names. And it's not an artificial, this is Fred, it's very much just trying to build a picture, build a history of a person that they're working with, on, or learning with, and from, and through. It enables a relationship for them to be formed to still treat that, those body parts as human. In the instance of donated dental casts, they were marked with the full name of the uh, patient. So these dental casts were being donated for an art installation, but that identification, that name, had to be removed. For me, it just feels there's contradictions and inconsistencies uh, when you look across the patch, across the field of donation for different purposes and different body parts and products that have been donated. So when we examine Titmus's work, I would argue that we discover a wealth of things, but these are just the ones I want to pull out. I think donations is more globally situated now. I don't think we can think the act of donation can simply be considered as one that's active, that's physical or conscious. I think it's not always clear who is doing the donating or if the person owns his or her body parts to give them away. And I think anonymity and identity are significant in how we interpret and understand donors' bodies and shapes the relationships for recipients who donated their body parts and products. So when we think about it, this is gift discourse, and this is, I've got this from a wealth of uh, more, it's far more experienced and senior researchers than myself. It's described as oversimplistic, it's unrealistic. It doesn't reflect the complexity.
complexity within and surrounding donation, and it idealises the donation system. Some researchers have responded to this and have questioned whether donation is actually fit for purpose. They've questioned whether the concept of donation can adequately capture the act and process, given the meanings and associations with donation since the shift, since Clippers first wrote about the gift relationship. They present the term as somehow deficient or lacking in some way. We hear the idea of, is it an exchange or is it participation? Is it a transfer to try and capture these diverse elements of donation? However, to me, the meaning of donation is not static. It's ever evolving. And as a result, it can incorporate these new cultural scripts that reflect modern processes and practices that exist within and around donation. So, drawing inspiration from uh, <coughs> acting at my pine, many, many inspirations over the years of science and technology studies scholars. Donation, therefore, is a tangled web of people and policy, process and practice and relationships. It appears without set limits or boundaries. How we understand donation is ever evolving, and we therefore need to pay attention to what we research and how we research in the field of donation. So when we think about what we research, I'd like to pose a few questions, and this is not to say that I somehow know the answers or I'm doing it better than yourselves, so let me be clear. But as researchers, are we guilty of responding to societal, to political, medical advances and developments and treating them as areas of interest, which are not reflected in the issues that the lay public are grappling with, but are those facilitating donation? For me, I'm incredibly passionate that research has a relevance to the tax pay, and I want to make sure that what I'm doing, uh, and maybe it's about my own ego, but has some kind of influence and impact, however small. But I'm really enjoying uh, preparing for this uh, this conference. I have been reading far more around Merleau Ponty's work. I told you I'm pushing myself out of my boundaries with this. But those researchers who are drawing on Merleau Ponty's work are inviting us to reconsider what we class in the <coughs> data. So I'm thinking of Anne Marie Boylan and Louise Lowcock, who have been working on narratives. <coughs> the idea that an interview, even to a qualitative study such as mine, perhaps is a form of donation, and I haven't really thought about it in that way, no, in honesty. But then reading for this, uh, and reading the team's work about and researchers' emotional reactions to the data, the interview data, in my case, that I would have collected, that's invisible. And I just said last night, you know, when I was doing a PhD on embryo donation, I'm sat in somebody's home, surrounded by their belongings and pictures of their baby, um, and talking about the husband's sperm count. And I'm there for two and a half hours with a cup of tea, and I'm sharing that I'm adopted, and, you know, we're having a good natter. And you think, crikey, that's such an emotional reaction. There's been so much giving from both sides. But there's so much invisible. I don't, I don't tell, I don't report that. I just stick to my interview trying to be a data expert. So why are we researching what are our own or our institutions or more likely our funders, um, and I'm certainly guilty of that, are there values and priorities dominating our research topics and our questions around donation? And then how we research. As researchers, I think we tend to think in our own silos, our own discipline boundaries, or it's either about the product that's being donated or the purpose to be donated, or we stick to social, medical sociology or medical ethics, for example. And yet actually... What I want to encourage us to do is to take a bird's eye view of the donation landscape. I want us to see what we can learn from other forms of donation and other purposes of donation. So, for example, mill teeth were donated by the public in an art installation and were described by the artist as a symbol of transition and progress. And that, could, for me, could be equally relevant to breast milk donation, to blood donation, to organ donation. As researchers, do we think in silos as we believe there is something unique about the art, the specific act, the process, and the body parts that means that lessons can't be transferred and applied to a topic of the study? Can we draw inspiration by looking outside our strict discipline boundaries in order to reimagine donation? My last two slides. I think there's a need to perceive donation as messy not straightforward, and as Alexa had always said, it is messy. Um, it's not straightforward or it's not clear cut. And I think it, this needs to be reflected in how we research the area, as well as how we discuss it. For me, there are sliding scales of donation. People are willing to donate some body parts and not others. My husband, who's a biologist, he said you can have whatever body part you want, but don't take his eyes. <laughs> 
I think I'm probably guilty of doing the same, of feeling the same. We're happy to have our tissue or embryos used for research, perhaps, but not for treatment for other people to conceive. We're happy to help one particular group of people, but perhaps not another. In essence, we can be a donor in one context, but not in another. The context of purpose and donation can result in these hierarchies forming, but they don't easily map onto one another. It's based around a value of the body part or an outcome that's acquired through and attached to the process of donation. So all donors and all donations, when we think about hierarchies, are not equal. The creation of a donation can require very investment from a donor according to what is being donated. And I'm thinking here about the physical and emotional labour that an embryo donor might do and give in that donation compared to the donation of a urine sample for research. This element of generating a donation demonstrates a range of emotional attachment donors can have towards their donations. Raising the question if donating a brain tumour is somehow lower in the hierarchy than donating an aborted fetal tissue based on the initial moral origins of that donation. And my last slide, please take a bird's eye view of donation. Draw on those system thinkers and complexity scholars, and I am very firmly working outside my own discipline boundaries. I would like to look for the areas of uncertainty within and surrounding donation, resulting from a wide range of factors. It might be complex human emotions and behaviours, it might be immunology, it might be processing techniques. When you do look for the uncertainty in a system of donation, for me, it highlights the incomplete knowledge that exists within the system. This has really come about when we talk about how we speak to embryologists and how they choose which embryo to implant back to a person. It also shows when you look at how we determine quality cord blood, we talk a lot about quality in cord blood for transplants, but how, when you ask me how you determine that quality, it's, there's a multitude of factors in which not everybody agrees on, despite what the science, science tells us that it's about a certain match, an 8 out of 10 match, or a 6 out of 10 match around a, CD, a number of CD34 cells. I think a system view of donation will identify aspects of donation that are not clear cut, and these new areas are for future research bubble to the surface. I think if we can recognise the commonalities and the dissimilarities between attitudes to the donation of different body parts and products, can provide a <coughs> evidence to understand the different cultural meanings of the body. We can pick out common themes, such as our limiting, and see how they play in different settings. What comparisons can we make between the anonymity of an organ donor versus a gallant donor? By making such comparisons, we can see areas where there are similarities and dissonance. And I hope this can then produce the new conceptualisations by disrupting our previously held assumptions and meanings and illuminating how anonymity functions in these different contexts <coughs> and donation more broadly. Thank you very much. <laughs> chip in, I suppose, with the question about the philosophical basis for much of this discourse, including you know, not only analytically by academics studying it in SDS people, yeah. but also in the broader public domain, because much of the way that we, it seems to me, and I'm not claiming to be an expert on Kant at all, but much of the language that is both popular and observed uh, by professionals is Kantian, i.e. that there is a dignity afforded to the courts and that we are in possession of uh, our bodies, that they are you know, ours by right and uh, they are to that extent inviolable. So it's the treat others as you would be treated yourself, which you know, is something that emerges strongly in the Enlightenment, uh, at least in principle, if not in practice. So I'm just wondering um, if you had any thoughts about you know, this philosophical which would probably begin, although they may seem abstruse, actually do inform 
quite a lot of uh, practice and popular thinking. Oh gosh, do you think? I'm, yes, big question. I've kind of I've this down because I don't want to lose it because I'm thinking I've not. I don't think I've currently referenced Kant and the categorical imperative <laughs> in my in this paper. And I'm thinking again. I probably need to. Um, so I don't. I would need to keep on thinking about this in order to uh, a thought, yeah, a more thought, a considered response. Because uh, at the moment it's not in my paper, and I think I've with a glaring gap. But that's a question which kind of reflects on. It's such a shame that Margaret doesn't have to do because she's thinking very much about well, because we're thinking about her donation, which obviously involves, of course. <laughs> um, she's thinking very much about the organ living on and what the implications then are in terms of death. I mean, who's death? What death? Yeah. When does death occur? <laughs> um, because obviously that organ life is prolonged. That, the, the life of that organ is prolonged in another host. Um, so, and I think that is interesting, actually, because I think about how the women in the uh, nearest Becker's work, which is obviously in the debate now, but talking about they felt they were giving, there was an element of dignity, I'm sure they would have preferred dignity, and this idea that they were sort of somehow continuing by giving this donation to stem cell research, which is continuation of life and respect in their life. And I think dignity is something we should, I don't know if I have to actually put it in this paper, I think it's a really interesting idea of looking at dignity across the different donation purposes and different donated body parts and fluids. You've given me, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I can't give you it, but that's, it's very, it's giving me something to think about actually, a new angle to look across the patch of donation around the, the skill of dignity. Can we just go back to the beginning of this, and I'm very yes. interested to hear about the murder haunting. Yes, oh sorry, I, yes, I was right, I do want to lose it because that was a bit hard, but um, so the murder haunting, uh, I was thinking about, uh, well, I've been working with Andrew Boyden and Louise Lowcott, Louise is now at Aberdeen, but they were both at Oxford at the time that I was working with them. And it was on a paper around narratives, donations, this idea of this mind and body split, and this sort of trying to avoid this biomedical separation of mind and body. And um, if we don't follow this, if we don't if we just get ourselves entrenched in this, the mind is separate from the body, then actually does this become a form of embodied delivery? Are we giving something? Can the narrative that we're giving, the emotion that is being delivered through that narrative, can we view that as a form of donation that we need to put on part? With organ donation, breast milk donation, for example. Um, and that, sorry, this sounds very um, like I'm trying to promote, but um, the paper has been accepted and it's available, it's full of paper that we've written. There was a lot of to. Um, but that was what they were thinking, they were talking there about uh, it was drawing on their work of tissue donors to clinical trials and they were trying to push it on par the, the narratives that have come through the patients, or oh, the health cycle of DIPEX. The, Health talk. Health, talk. health talk. So they were trying to say, can we not can make comparisons? Uh, is it not the same form of donation for the women, for people who give donations to health talk, video slips, and the same for tissue donors that they donate to clinical trials? Um, and then the other one about the emotional reactions was from your, the team's work here um, uh, in Margaret Children's say, I think it was she, the author of, uh, around how you've been observing video recordings of the interviews and researchers at the time would have an emotional reaction and that itself could that be a, could that become data that yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you that, yes thank you and, when, and Stephanie Parsons and I were talking last night about how what you don't what you don't report and is that still data and can we class that as data and so uh, so for me I was thinking about uh, when I gave it, did a five-hour interview with a woman who had also been adopted, and we looked incredibly similar. And there was this moment where we were kind of looking at each other, going, "Could we possibly, you know, is this that?" And what happened was is the relationship got very messy. Uh, the boundaries between an interviewer and an interviewee got very blurred, and there was a flight up to meet me and leave. There was Christmas cards. There was boxes of fudge. Then it led on to can you give me some advice on what to do with my embryos? And this doesn't get reported. I don't tell the ethics committee either. <laughs> <laughs> um, this doesn't get reported. And it, when you report the data, when you talk about the project, when you talk about donation, and I was wondering, how, Stephanie and I were talking about how much of that is still data, can that still be classed as data, which is about donation? 
I think this is something interesting. That's where I think artists could do kind of coming because we are not necessarily consumed or seen as being involved in this data or providing data or right. knowledge in that form. And also, our output tends not to be for the rarefied audience of peer reviewed journals, yeah. but for larger public acceptance. And so, our, our method of distributing our work is very different. And I do think that there is a way in which we obviously we want, I think, our disciplines to expand it focus on the knowledge of data, but also to really think about how artists are and the way they work can also be impactful or really yeah. useful in, in exploring that that really complicated notion of data that's so far as we think about what they're doing in terms of that. And then there's another layer of data from the audience looking at the exhibition. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. They also attend yeah. by something to generate yeah. so mm -hmm. like, Speaking of which,